a little bit about yourself. You know? Yeah. Like introduce yourself. I will. I will. Well, first of all, thank you so much for spending your evening here, even with the threat of whatever is coming our way. Um, David <coughs> sent me a text this morning. He's like, you might want to check what's going on. <laughs> and I did. It's like, oh, that's not until the middle of the night. It, we're okay. But thank you so much for being here, for sure. Um, so I am from Wichita um, and uh, mostly grew up in Wichita, for sure. Um, graduated from Wichita State University with an MFA degree in painting um, way back in 2008. So that's kind of where I'm stationed. But uh, making painting, of course, certainly a part of my practice. Teaching also very much a part of my practice as well. Um, I teach high school in Wichita, high school drawing and painting teacher. And to me, those are just two parts uh, that, that kind of feed my, my, my creative, I don't know batteries for sure at the same time. One being a little bit more quiet and contemplative, working away in my own studio, and then one that's about uh, performing out there to the masses a little bit more. So, uh, It is true that right now I do have work on display at Mark Arts in Wichita and at the Lawrence Art Center. True story is that when David, way back in August, sent me an email and said, hey, would you be interested in having a show here in Great Bend? I received an email that very same day. I was on a road trip. I was taking my family out to look at, you know, Canopolis and received uh, two emails on that day. And one was from the Lawrence Art Center, one was from David. And I turned to my wife, I was like, what's going on? And she's like, well, it's just, <laughs> Every time has come. yeah, when you focus on things, good things happen. Good things come your way. So, and I love uh, being in supportive communities. So again, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to try to speak with my teacher voice tonight, but if I start to drift off and mumble a little bit, please let me know if you can't hear me very well. Um, I don't, I'm not used to the acoustics of this space yet, so just let me know. Um, so I was just going to talk a little bit about the work and how it, this, the, the work that's here developed. This body of work for me is very much grounded in pandemic times. Uh, almost all of it was produced during that, that time that we call lockdown. Um, some of it a little before and a little bit after. And I do find as an artist that when artists over explain their work, it takes a little bit of the magic away. But I want to give enough, uh, you know, footholds and handholds that you might be able to look at some of the works that's going on around the gallery and say, oh, I can kind of see where he's coming from here a little bit or whatever. Uh, having said that, after I, you know, talk a little bit or even in the middle of, uh, me speaking, please feel free to raise your hand and just ask a question, you know, and I'd, I'd love to do some talking back and forth if you have observations or questions you want to share as well. So I was teaching, um, well, I'll just going to go back and say my approach to teaching art and making art has always been with a certain posture of thinking about painting as a ridiculous endeavor, just completely ridiculous. I think that that comes from my working class upbringing. You know, I come from a big family, seven brothers and sisters I grew up with, two parents and me in the same house, so 10 people crammed into one space, sharing bathrooms and bedrooms and clothes and everything else just to make, you know, things happen. The household I grew up in wasn't exactly geared towards things like making art. It was you know, we were living in survival mode most of the time uh, as we, you know, lived on top of and around each other constantly. Um, but in the middle of that, I always had this one thing that I like to do, and that's draw. And it was just, a, a, you know, something that kind of set me apart, maybe first of all, from some of my siblings and then eventually my classmates as well, so on and so forth. And it started to send me to some pretty strange places like college. Uh, because <laughs> the household I grew up in, people didn't really go to college, right? They weren't very working class kind of family. And so it was a strange thing to think about going to college in general, going to college for art, even stranger, you know? Uh, it, there's not really, you know, art is this, 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 this activity that produces physical objects, but it's just, they're so um, non-utilitarian, these objects, you know, they're not the kind of thing that can help you survive often in a very, you know, direct physical way. So, so when I went to college, I was really excited to be there, uh, 
really excited to get immersed in the thing that I was falling in love with, which was drawing and painting especially. But uh, I've always kind of taken the stance towards making art that is about kind of like, yeah, this is kind of a ridiculous proposal, right? Uh, to spend a lot of time making something that is just going to hang on a wall or whatever. Um, to compound that, I, I teach in a very low income school. You know, it's, it's in the same neighborhood I grew up in. There are families that I relate to. It's about a 90% uh, poverty rate at the school that I teach in. And so these are students who are signing up for my classes and I am in the process of convincing them that art is something that it's okay to dedicate some time and energy to uh, when they may be in survival mode themselves and their families are in survival mode. But I really appreciate that challenge uh, and I think that it has definitely colored my pose towards painting. So in grad school and afterwards, it's always been this question of why even make a painting, you know? <coughs> Or if you're gonna make a painting, you might as well question just about anything you can about the process. And so <laughs> that's kind of the, the, the backdrop that uh, I was producing up until you know, uh, that, that winter in, in 2020 when we started to get these terrible news reports about crazy things that were happening around the world, as if the world hadn't been crazy for a while there anyways, uh, for sure. But you know, in, in shutdown, you know, school's canceled the rest of the year. I got all this extra studio time and I started thinking, like most people, well, how do you process this experience that we're going through? And especially, I know a lot of creative people were asking themselves, is this even worth it? You know, making music, making art, writing a poem, when the world just seems to be falling in on itself, you know, constantly, how could this be a helpful thing? And I remember being in the middle of trying to process that and process the fact that I wasn't even going to be teaching, which is a big part of who I am as a person. And I remember I was in a parking lot uh, of a grocery store, opened my car door, and I stepped out, and I saw this beer can, and it was just, you know, smashed. It had been run over several times, and maybe it was just, you know, pent-up frustration that I had or, you know, uh, heavy feelings about the world at that time, but I remember looking at that beer can thinking, man, same, you know, like I, I, I totally related to this object, which is really kind of the, uh, a mode that I'd been in for a while, like looking at objects and figuring out how to empathize with an object, still life, you know? So I picked up that beer can and I took it home and just let it hang on the wall in my studio and I just kept staring at it and trying to figure out, what are you trying to tell me, you know? <laughs> So there's a piece at this back wall, all the way opposite of myself, and it is a rather cubist approach to painting a beer can, but it's a beer can that's been smashed a few times. Cubism, you know? Uh, and if you look at it close, you might be able to notice some features from a Budweiser label or whatever. That piece is called Holding Up, because every time I was having a conversation with anybody outside my household, it was always, how are you doing? Oh, well, you know, holding up. <laughs> just very Midwestern response to things, um, you know. Anyway, so producing this piece, and I started to think more and more about this process of smashing and running things over, <laughs> and I just decided I'm just going to go with this as much as I could. I had a lot of old paintings sitting around my studio, decided I'm going to soak them in water and run them through a blender. Sure, just cathartic experience for sure. I'll be pouring out this paper pulp. What am I going to do with it? And at first it was just, I'm going to, in my driveway, I'm going to run some things over with my pickup truck <laughs> back and forth. What am I doing? I don't know. I got a lot of extra time on my hands. Neighbors wonder what I'm up to in my driveway, for sure. If you look around at these framed pieces, the only pieces in the show that do feature a frame, um, you'll see these handmade paper pieces that are made from processed paintings that have been run over with different textures, you know? You start looking around and you're like, oh, that, that's an interesting texture. What happens if I push that into some soft paper? What can I create? But that was uh, kind of what the beginning of the pandemic was like for me personally. Now, of course, before then, I was already experimenting with what is the most ridiculous way I can make a painting, you know? And 
what if I don't even need a frame anymore? That's a question I've asked myself many, many times. You know, what if a piece doesn't sit pretty on the wall and it wants to kind of climb off and kind of even sag, you know, and, and kind of fold in on itself? Last night I was talking to uh, some people in Lawrence and we were talking about <laughs> my relationship with frames. And I said, you know, when I was in, <laughs> in grad school, I remember one of the first paintings I put on, you know, display for a crit. I was really excited about this new painting, but I'd done such a bad job at stretching it over a frame that that entire crit, I just got hammered um, as an artist because all they wanted to talk about was what a bad job I had done stretching this canvas over this frame. And I was like, can we talk about this painting? And they were like, no, we're too distracted by the terrible job you did stretching this over the frame. And that, that, that experience always stuck in my head, you know, because having that experience of being, you know, kind of a poor working class kid that found his way into art school, this idea that, well, so there's all these rules, you know, for what is appropriate and what's not appropriate and what's, what's good art and what's bad art. And wouldn't it be fun to just kind of play with those rules more and more? And so eventually the work that I was producing started to climb off the frame. And when if you let go of a frame, maybe before long it, you're asking questions like, well, what if I let go of canvas? What if paint is just this own force that can do something all by itself? And so I started experimenting with creating large scale paint skins. So if you look at pieces like this one right here, um, it is actually one large paint skin. No canvas involved in the process at all. So what I was doing was painting with acrylics on plastic sheets, you know, and letting the paint dry in layers and using a lot of flexible mediums. Um, but when it got thick enough, then I could peel the whole thing off all at once like a skin that had just been flattened, <laughs> a process that I kept thinking of. Um, it allowed me to do some other things too that I've always been interested in, some surrealist things. You know, if you dig into your art history and you study the history of surrealism, you know, this idea of reading textures through a process called frottage or rubbings, making rubbings of surfaces. I was very interested in this idea of making rubbings of surfaces. So while I had this flexible plastic sheet, I could say drape it over the top of a tire and make a rubbing of that tire, you know, using acrylic paint. And I found, oh, that sticks with the piece for sure. It means I had to work backwards because I'm painting one way and then peeling the whole thing off of a plastic sheet. Now there's other technical tricks involved because I could use, say, a netting pro uh, that I can kind of embed in that, pla in that paint skin so that it's easier to peel off all at once. But I did have to spell the words sad ones backwards, which I will tell you, for, for somebody like me, that was a challenge for sure. Uh, <laughs> while I was, in, and then these pieces have been adhered to felt. I often have people ask me, can I touch that? And I will be honest, I don't, I touch it a lot, so I'm not that panicked about it. But if you want to feel what that feels like, without touching the art on the wall because you know you're not supposed to do that, whatever. Uh, on that pedestal on your way out, there is a collection of business cards that have been made out of some of these holes that were cut in this process. And you can kind of feel what that feels like. Take a piece of the painting home for yourself so you can feel what that, that feels like. Anyway, this piece was produced again towards the beginning of that pandemic. And, you know, I think like a lot of people, hold up at home, you started to think back to other times, maybe when the world wasn't the way it was. And I started thinking about, you know, I get nostalgic pretty easily. Maybe I'm also getting, you know, I, I turned 45 this year. So I'm starting to think back to like a younger version of myself for sure. And I was thinking about times when people used to, you know, collect songs on cassette tapes, mixtapes, you know, and a time when there wasn't all of this internet blaring into me all the time. It was about, no, I have to listen to the radio and I'm gonna have to wait for that song to, to, to finally come on so I could hit record, you know? Something that if I explain to my students now, they, they cannot understand. It's like, you can't look it up on a streaming service, you know? 
a telephone hung on the wall like this. Anyways, <laughs> so uh, if you look closely at a lot of these pieces, they reference a subject and they also are very complicated by things like tire tracks, but this is a cassette tape with a thumb that's holding it. It was just from a photo I took of myself holding a, an old cassette tape that did contain a collection of sad songs that I had put together on a cassette tape when I was young. So there you go. I think that I've always been really interested in uh, the stories I can tell about Middle America or about my particular walk through Middle America without referencing the figure. In fact, this is probably the closest I'll get to referencing the figure, you know. <laughs> Just the thumb. I think that I like objects that can speak, and that might be kind of a surrealist thing, like objects that kind of tell their own stories because of the histories that they hold um, or the way that they make you think about a whole experience. And then also landscape. I've been working you know, in landscape for pretty much my entire um, artistic career. Definitely growing up in middle America, landscape's always there with us for sure. Um, and so I did begin taking these long walks during the pandemic and walking through landscapes that are not always pretty, for sure. You know, in general, I don't think people think of this part of the country as not always the prettiest part of the country. As I was driving in, I saw an amazing sunset tonight. I was like, you can't get this anywhere else. What are you talking about? <laughs> but, <laughs> but living in the center of Wichita, um, in, a, in a neighborhood that isn't the prettiest neighborhood, we'll just say, an aging neighborhood for sure. I'm always taking note of how beauty and ugliness are just bumping up against each other constantly. And that is my experience as a landscape. You know, beauty and ugly kind of jammed together in one place. I'm very interested in what humans leave behind, you know, not just rubbish, but like what humans leave behind as marks for themselves. So if you look at some of these larger landscapes, you'll see references to things that humans leave behind, like tire tracks, uh, but also <laughs> things that might look colorful and pretty, like the packaging on something that somebody might have thrown out their window or whatever. Uh, maybe even references to graffiti and things like that that you might see as you're walking through an urban landscape or even a non-urban landscape for sure. Um, but that might talk about some of the types of pieces that you see here. I mean, certainly with every single one of these pieces, I could tell a story about what I was really thinking about when I was making that piece. Um, but it is true that if you look at some of these objects, they do start to declare themselves as an object <laughs> a little bit more. If it's a giant pair of underwear stuck to the wall back there or a, an iron that's made out of corrugated metal, which Seems counterintuitive, for sure. <laughs> David told me that there was a shape here that most people had uh, more questions about, and it is probably one that really kind of pushes uh, representation to its limits a little bit. Um, but just a familiar image to me, it's a, it's a jar of Vaseline with its lid propped up against it, you know, for sure. I am interested in, I, I think, you know, I've always loved drawing. That's kind of where everything started for me. But can I represent an object? And then how far can I stretch it so that it still sucks me into something familiar, even as I'm subtracting from it, as I'm distorting how color harmonies are going to work together to describe these surface planes, so on and so forth. Um, I never had a moment where I was just really set out. I have to cut a hole in a painting. It just kind of is something that happened eventually. Um, as a way of kind of inviting in the outside world. You know, what happens if uh, a painting has to compete more with some of those forces that are around us all the time, you know? I tell my students, you know, that something you hear a lot in, in art history is that, you know, a lot of artists conceive of a painting as a window that you get to disappear into. And I think there's that part of me that's wants to hold painting a little bit more accountable than that. And you, know, you can't really disappear into art completely. You know, there's always the, out, the outside world never goes away. It's always going to compete. And those concerns are always going to be there. And why not make a, a piece that has to cooperate with that or fight with it just a little bit more, you know? <laughs>
for sure. Um, but if you look at the work, you will see references to things, other things that do look familiar, like I said, certain textures, um, even ways of mark making. It is true that I almost never use a paintbrush in my studio, um, not because I'm opposed to it, uh, more, more like I, I would rather drag paint across the surface using something that is a little bit non-conventional. It will give me a more interesting read of a surface. So I'm often buying you know, supplies not at an art store, but at uh, you know, our local surplus supply store, hardware store. Thrift store has, you know, in the kitchen section, all kinds of really interesting utensils you could smear paint across with, you know, for sure. But um, that idea of just kind of being indirect and in how a painting gets made. Uh, what happens if you have to make it somewhere else and then transfer it? Well, some of these big landscapes you'll notice, they almost look like collage, but they are 100% acrylic paint. Um, I've just been in the habit of collecting brush strokes on plastic for a long time. Color samples I like, texture samples I like, allow those to dry, and then I can transfer it to another surface, almost like a decal, you know, using acrylic medium. Um, just think about it like a fruit roll-up that you could just like peel right off the surface. Because um, <laughs> again, I think it's more interesting when you have to really dissect how a painting even gets made and make it compete. And certainly if you look at the back wall, you'll see a, a grid um, there's a frame for you, but a, a grid that is made up of just readings of the sky, you know, different moments of time in the sky, different times of day, at least that's the color harmonies that I was going for. Um, you know, a beautiful subject in Kansas, the sky, but what happens when it has to kind of compete with some of the, the grittiness of other things. So. Um, 